Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, we're about to get started. Thanks for your patience. My name is Louisa Ouliat. I'm curator of talks and events at the Photographer's Gallery. Uh, we're really excited to be here tonight with uh, Tina Camp and Stanley Oloko Wanambwa. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, Tina is a Black feminist theorist of visual culture and contemporary art. Her research has taken us into Black visuality and new approaches to experience and see the Black subject. In her new book, A Black Gaze, which I happen to have here, uh, which she will also read from and discuss further tonight, she challenges dominant viewing practices through the work of a series of artists such as Simone Lee, Khalil Joseph, and Arthur Jaffa. Stanley is a photographer and writer. He also comes tonight with a new publication entitled Dark Mirrors, and we'll go further into his discussion on contemporary photographic practices, how artistic practices connect with wider and disparate histories to the contemporary experience, the complex relationship of, of anti-Blackness and visuality, and how this is embodied in visual media. I'll share more information on their respective books using the chat function here. Anyway, together they will look at how artists are creating spectral experiences of racial difference across both their projects and research. In terms of format, the event will be a combination of readings and discussions and responses by both. There'll be time at the end for questions and comments from you, but we will begin first with Stanley and then move between the two of them. Uh, the event should last roughly one hour in total. Please note we are recording this, however, you will not be, be featured and will only appear at the end if you decide to pose your question directly. Please note we are approaching this event with the aim of creating a form of trust and mutual respect, so please keep that in mind. And lastly, before we start, I would like to thank all of you all for joining us. We hope to see you again at some of our other forthcoming online activities, and even more hopefully at the gallery when we open again this coming Friday with a retrospective of American photographer Helen Levitt and a new commission by British artist Helen Kamek. Anyway, thank you all again. And now to Stanley Laku uh, Wanambwa. Hi, uh, good evening if you're in the UK, good afternoon if you're on the East Coast, and is, yeah, good morning if you're on the West Coast. Um, thanks very much for joining us, and thanks to Louisa and to Martin Steiniger for the invitation. Thanks to Jess Goff and everybody at Mac for the support in terms of not just the event today, but the, the release of my book. And thank you, Tina, um, for agreeing to be in dialogue with me again. It's a pleasure to do this. Um, it's a little odd that you're in London and I'm in uh, America, but there we go. Um, maybe there's, maybe that makes sense. Uh, there was a question about the recording in the chat there. Just uh, I, they'll be published, I think, on both Mac and the Photographer's Gallery's YouTube channels next week. So yes, it will be available. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read one of the essays from my book, Dark Mirrors, uh, which has just now come out. Um, and then I think Tina and I will have a, a brief dialogue and then Tina will read from her new book, A Black Gaze, and then we'll have a dialogue about that. And then we'll sort of open into a wider discussion and then hopefully involve some of you in it uh, and your questions. I see a number of names of people who I know or recognize in the room. So it's, it's good to be in, in contact with you guys again. And I look forward to hearing from you. Um, I'm going to just set up my screen share now and I'm going to read an essay called Black Stars, which is on the work of Dina Lawson. It feels especially timely to be doing this in this particular moment. Um, so just bear me while I get things set up here. Okay. Dina Lawson is the daughter of a father who worked for Xerox, a mother who worked for Kodak in Rochester, New York, where Lawson grew up, and the granddaughter of a woman who cleaned the home of George Eastman, founder of the Eastman Kodak Company. Lawson's genealogy is thus bound up at the same time with the modernizing technologies of reproduction and with the late 20th century obsolescence of industrial American life. That she became a photographer, as artist Arthur Jaffer has observed, doesn't seem arbitrary. That she has latterly become a preeminent portraitist in contemporary American art is both timely and indisputable on the evidence of her photographs alone. On the 6th of August 2019, Puis Marseille in Amsterdam opened the first large scale solo exhibition of Lawson's work in Europe, following on from the publication by Aperture in 2018 of Lawson's eponymously titled book, Dina Lawson, an Aperture Monograph, which drew together a selection of images from 15 years of artistic production. For those unfamiliar with Lawson's work, the exhibition offers an unprecedented opportunity to reckon with the rich complexity of her portraits, and most especially with her sensuous and intense exploration of black life. Lawson's maternal relations hail from upstate New York, 
while the paternal side of her family came up to Rochester from Sanford, Florida, site of the murder of young, black, unarmed Trayvon Martin in February 2012. Such disparate regional African-American roots contribute to an origin story that helped to foster the myth that their family must have been part of the Underground Railroad. In a conversation with Jaffa from 2018, Lawson described the differing class positions of the two sides of her family, noting that her mother's side were more resolutely working class, rough, honest, sharply dressed, quick to fight with their hands, generous with love and acceptance, loud talking, cigarette smoking, homes kept clean, church going, but they would go out on the weekends. While over in her father's more middle class side of the family, the volume turns down. Such formative characteristics as Lawson describes here are resonant with the central facets of her portrait practice, both in its exclusive focus on the depiction of black life and black bodies, and in its insistent figuring of and engagement with the representation of the black working class. Whether made in the United States, Jamaica, the, De the Democratic Republic of Congo or South Africa, whether within the confines of domestic interiors out in the woods or on the street, Lawson's carefully lit portraits lend luster and specificity to various markers of class as they intersect with gender and race in her portraiture. The densely colored shimmering whole resolving into a nuanced and diasporic image of blackness writ large around the globe. In Brother and Sister from 2017, a young man in his bedroom throws up a West Side gang sign to the lens. Excuse me. As his baby sister tucks her face behind his left leg. In the background, the frayed and stained edges of a warped drop ceiling imperfectly connect to a lightly plastered brick wall, while his sober, mismatched vanity and armoire stand in stark relief to the bright array of Puma, Fila, Chuck Taylor and Nike kicks stacked neatly along the wall. The portrait distills a set of differences or oppositions between South African and African-American modalities of blackness, between township and ghetto, between extroversion and recalcitrance, or between poverty and wealth. More than this, however, as the image extends and expands with intensifying attention, the word dream emerges in linear repetition on a bedroll folded against the rear wall. It's monochromatic patterning of blue and white, drawing the eye towards the repeating motif of blue and white birds, pirouetting across the surface of the bedspread, seemingly in a mating ritual, as irregular rows of bright red hearts scatter across his sister's white cardigan. As in much of Lawson's portraiture, the interior space of domesticity is simultaneously transformed into a stage and addressed as a site through which distinct cultures intersect in a weave of black life that cannot be understood outside of its histories of flight and migration, nor sustained without its historic and contemporary practices of fabulation. Hers is a blackness that is neither monolithic nor separable in its innumerable variations. We might conceive of signs from 2016 as affecting a call and response with this young Soweto man, in which the young man at far left in the frame issues a middle finger to the Soweto gang sign from some dark point in the American Midwest, while the two friends to his left give a resounding thrums down to the camera lens. In signs, as in such portraits as Cowboys from 2014 and Flex from 2010, Lawson's framing and her emphatic use of artificial light sculpt supple black bodies into iconic abstractions infused with beauty and grace, and yet rendered with stark confrontational intensity. The picture's complex charge is then heightened by the scale of Lawson's prints, which frequently exceed one meter in length on the longest side. So that to look at her works on the wall is to be met with the density of a dimensional rendering of embodiment limbed with the electric glimmer of instantaneity. We are permitted no simplistic delectation of the inarguable beauty and sensuality of her sitters that might cleave off and disavow the fraught histories of racial subjection whose norms were enforced violently and arbitrarily within the realm of the visual. The very fact of an exhibition of Lawson's work in a canal house built during the Dutch golden century adds a rich complexity to its staging. The Huis Marseille was erected in a period in which Dutch monopolistic control of East Asian trade with Europe transformed the public finances. Just as its profitable brokerage of commodities flowing from European colonies in the Caribbean and North America 
to Eastern and Northern Europe contributed to an extended period of massive prosperity. There is no Dutch wealth proper to this period that is fully separable from the economies of racial subjugation. And in the low slung genteel confines of Puis Marseille, Lawson freights the pleasures of the unobstructed look with the structuring weight of such histories. She situates Sharon from 2007, a nude portrait of a black woman standing in front of white window frames covered by white Venetian blinds and diaphanous white drapes at the end of a gallery whose white framed windows give onto the, the building's bucolic gardens. Leisure is laced with uneven histories of expropriation in the placement of such works. The opening of the Huis Marseille shutters is echoed complexly in the opening of Lawson's lens to the bare black flesh of this young black woman, whose right shoulder is inched up toward her turning face so as to close off the camera's access to her bared breasts. She gazes at us with a level and unassailable confidence. The open Venetian blinds behind the diaphanous white drapes revealing to the street outside what her body forecloses to us as viewers of the photograph. There is in this image an oscillation between a blackness that is always already given over to the outside world and a blackness that is only fully unveiled in its unstable interior. Lawson's portraits are at once heightened and candid, theatrical and quotidian. They are reflexively down home, resolutely down home in their grounding in domestic space, and yet reflexive in their consistent attention to volatile dynamics and oscillating positions inherent in the act of looking and in racialized histories of imaging. Such concerns are often bodied forth faintly as details within her photographed scenes, in which family photographs punctuate the tabletops and shelves surrounding her central figures. At Huis Marseille, she weaves a latticed ivy thread of such vernacular images, both family photographs and press images, vertically up the edge of a mantelpiece that rises directly above a fireplace, T-pinning each image to the wall in precarious adhesion, reciting black families and black social life at the heart and heart of the Dutch interior. Elsewhere in the house, such images swarm in tight spiderweb clusters or snake along the seams of joins in the walls, figuring a blackness always in motion in congregation, in chained and serial extension. In her recurrent emphasis on vernacular archives of images that appear within her own formal portraits, her work surfaces the fact of, the, of two parallel economies of image circulation, which her practice straddles. One social, familiar, concerned with profusion and circulation as forms of value and rituals that preserve histories of black life against the forces that police and eradicate it. The other commercial, impersonal, institutional, concerned with the artificial scarcity of photographic images as a necessary precondition for the preservation of their economic value. In Lawson's stage works, it is unclear where fact and fabulation diverge from one another. And it seems likely that the photograph we are given to see will eventually find its place among the others amassed within the frame. While Lawson often photographs individuals whom she's encountered in the everyday course of their lives, she also casts couples and selects locations within which to stage her vivid scenes of black domesticity and sociality, frequently picturing her sitters in states of undress or nudity that are expressly theatrical. In spite of such theatricality, her couples often caress, mirror or entangle themselves together in ways that intimate the unconscious and intricate bonds of sexual and familial life. Yet they just as often gaze upon the lens with a stoicism or reserve that signals their explicit awareness of the camera's presence. The formality of the portrait constitutes the basis of our invitation into the scene, but not into the very grain of the life of the people that it portrays. We are permitted to enter, but we are not invited to stay. Rather, through Lawson's portraits, we are witness to a performance that redrafts the parameters of the real a performance that insists on black being in all its variegated fullness and intemperate grace. So that even if momentarily, her subjects to follow Mahalia Jackson, live the lives they sing about in their songs. Apologies, I thought this slide would just keep rotating there, but it didn't. Um, so I had to quickly catch it and drag it back to the beginning. Um, I wanna just say a quick thank you before we, we talk, Tina, to Emma Bowkett and to Liz Joby who commissioned that piece. Um, and to Liz Joby in particular, who also edited this book and 
whose patience um, has made all the small parts into a much, much better whole. So. Thank you for the reading. Um, <laughs> Stanley, it's so nice to see you. And yes, it is crazy that we have reversed our roles, <laughs> or, or at least our geographies. Exactly. Um, but, but it's nice to be in conversation, even if that's reversed. Um, thanks for the book as well. You know, I spent the morning inside of it, and it was a really lovely experience to be swimming around in it. Um, so I want to start out by asking you a few things about the book and the framing of it. And then I want to go into that chapter, which I love. <laughs> um, and the first is to ask you a little bit about um, what you're doing in it, um, because what you're doing in it is a really, you're making a series of really important interventions. Um, and I want to think about the stakes of those interventions. Mm -hmm. And you you set that out. Um, right up front in the in the introduction which is that you set out a claim um on you stake out a claim for um revaluing photo books um and revaluing photo books in a way that you explicitly say is not is in relationship to sort of the dominance of the public in the publication world of histories and theories of photography um but at the same time you're you're not trying to make it into a zero-sum game mm -hmm. um but in that, in making that claim, you do something really, really interesting to me. Um, and it's interesting for predictable reasons, as I'm going to tell you in a minute, um, which is you talk about the significance of photo books in creating a certain kind of grammar. Um, and you have this beautiful sentence that says, the photo book has offered the greatest room for the widest array of artistic practices in recent years. And that is, and that, and that it has aided and abetted the development of artistic grammars that give form to visions in short supply on the walls where we might otherwise see our art. And so there you're talking about the grammars that photo books contribute to creating. Mm -hmm. And then there's another kind of grammar that you also talk about in the book, which is the grammar that is your creative writing practice, right? Where you talk about art and the artists that you're, and their work through a concept of grammar, um, where you write that, that what you describe as your own critical practice is attending to grammars articulated within and between images produced in the work under review. So you know that I'm crazy about grammar, <laughs> I'm obsessed with grammar, so that your invocation of my obsession um, has, has a really important intervention, both on the level of the photo book as a genre and on the level of your own critical practice. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to hear more about those two different kinds of grammar, the artistic grammar, and then the, the grammars um, between, within, and among images. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I started writing about photography publicly a decade ago, um, and it, it felt like a response to a call that the artists were already making. Um, in, in the sense that I understood um, the expressive capabilities of the photo book um, to be both um, intelligible, sort of physically, corporeally, but also um, in this strange sort of alternation between, you know, a retinal experience and a discursive understanding of the image. And and I I, I felt then, and, and it, you know, I think it's continued to be true that there was a kind of extraordinary amount of really, really fine work being produced. And, there was no corresponding breadth or depth of critical discussion of that work. And so I was sort of responding by writing, you know, it felt like the work was calling out for, for a critical engagement with it. And um, so, yeah, I started writing and writing mostly about photo books um, in order to try to describe both the embodied experience of the sequential progression of photographs in a book and also the world making capabilities of the book as material object and of the pictorial language within a given body of work as a way to kind of remake uh, our relationship to the actual world. And the preponderant focus of that critical writing was art that is sort of broadly in some fundamental relationship to documentary practice, or that it wasn't exclusively that. Um, and one of the things I, I, I tried to do as a habit was to take seriously where and how books begin and mm. to assume that those decisions are actually foundational to everything else that happens afterwards. 
And then I tried to sort of see what would happen again, you know, kind of haptically, symbolically, um, emotionally, discursively, as you as you unwind the thread of a, of a photo book sequence. And so a lot of the writing I, I was doing then and a good amount of the writing that's in this book really follows the, the, the grain and the structure of the photo book itself as sequence. Um, and where it departs and sort of exp expands outward into a broader thematic engagement with the world of the work, it still, I think, very uh, habitually ties itself back to individual image, to composition and to the way that these things sort of layer upon each other through the progression of images in a sequence. And in that, in that way, I think my writing has, has where it's concerned, the photo book has really been in direct kind of dialogue with the developing grammar of a photographic sequence. And that, that didn't seem in 2011 like a kind of writing that was in, in wide supply. It hasn't become suddenly like a kind of writing that is in wide supply now, although there's certainly more of it. Um, and, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I think the, 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 the tendency often is to read a body of work through the kind of stated themes of its public materials and not to attend to how pictures accumulate and differentiate and concatenate um, and to the, the kind of distinctive ways that they sort of symbolically build out the contours of a particular kind of vision of and, and, and engagement with the world. Um, and I've wanted to do that as, as a writer and I think also unde undeniably because I'm a photographer and I know how hard it is to do the thing that these people are doing and um, how enriching it can be to kind of follow follow along the line they're leading and see to see what it produces. Um, you know, the one of the kind of drawbacks, I suppose, in the circumstances within which I've been able to write about some of the books in, in Dark Mirrors is that I'm invited to contribute essays to books before they physically exist. So I'm not able to give the same kind of textured and dimensional um, reading of the object as I would do if the book had been published and then I was writing afterwards. Um, so often I'm writing about images that I'm seeing either as small prints or as PDFs and not as a sort of physical, physical thing. But I, I do think that for me, the, the interpretive opportunity is, is precisely to kind of think about the intersubjective encounter I have with an image on a printed page and to think about the kind of triangulation that is created between me, the historic depicted moment and the, the contemporary world that I'm, that I'm embedded in and to see how those, those positions and relationships are shifted by the image. Um, so that's been, I think, a central part of, and this is a very broad way of answering, but that's been a central kind of commitment in terms of the writing I've been doing about photography is to name my physical experience, to name my understanding of the denotative meaning of the images and to attend to how they, they slowly and, and subtly accumulate these particular expressive relationships that begin to figure a sense of a much wider world. And hopefully I'm doing that in, in all of the instances in the book where I'm writing principally about photo books. The, the, the task shifts a bit when it comes to writing about exhibitions, although that's also something I very much enjoy. I mean, I ask about grammar and I'm sorry, all of a sudden it's very noisy here, but um, I ask about grammar because that intervention is important because to me it's about asking about doing, right? Mm. So it's about asking about what do photo books do? And mm. it's about asking about what do photographs do in relation, right? As opposed to thinking about them as either presentation or depiction, right? Mm -hmm. That when you're talking about a grammar, then you're activating them. Um, and, and I think that that's actually quite radical. And it's not that it's not that it was a, a lacuna or not only that it was a lacuna to be able to write in this way. Um, it's also about daring to engage the particular artists at that level as well. Um, and and I, I think that you're actually doing that in this beautiful way in um, Dina Lawson's work, which is what I also really, really, really want to talk to you about. Um, mm -hmm. And you mentioned very sort of gracefully um, that uh, this is a particularly good time to be talking about Dina Lawson's work. And for those who do not understand what a particularly important time it is uh, to be able to be, to have to talk about this is that um, there was a very, pointed and to me controversial um, article that was published a couple of weeks ago in Hyperallergic, um, extremely critical of Dina's work for a number of different reasons. Um, and 
I find, found it incredibly refreshing um, to read your reading of Dina's work, particularly, you know, not only from the perspective of somebody who writes about photography, but also as a photographer, because one of the things that you do is you focus on lighting, right? The mm -hmm. precision of her lighting. And you read it in that, in that chapter, in the section that you read that you talk about it as luster, right? Mm -hmm. You talk about um, it, that it, that her lighting lends luster and specificity to, and then dot, 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 but to markers of class as they intersect with gender and race in her portraiture. Um, and then you continue her use of artificial light sculpts supple black bodies into iconic abstractions infused with beauty and grace and yet rendered with stark confrontational intensity. So what you're doing there is you're actually talking about the, the where is right? What is the mechanics of the construction of her images? And what does it in turn do, right? Mm -hmm. The critique, part of the critique that was made about her had to do with something that comes from her use of lighting, which is sheen, right? Mm -hmm. And so what is the difference between sheen and luster, right? And how is it intentionally transformed in, in her particular, um, her particular practice. So I wanted to actually get, have you talk more about sort of the technical practice that she is deploying that in turn sort of enervates and irritates a lot of people, particularly in this one article. Um, and then to talk about um, what I see as um, what those, um, what those criticisms are missing Mm -hmm. as well as why they keep coming back because the, yeah. it's those two things that that combine that i find really fascinating and the way in which you actually talk about the creative technical aspects of it um was illuminating in a way that i think needs to be illuminated yeah i mean i, I think there's a complex rhetorical event unfolding in dina's portraits and um, I think its complexity is earned, and I think that aspects of it likely are sort of excessive for some people. Um, but you know, if if we're if we're talking here sort of at the moment about artificial light and its sort of intervent its its introduction into the black interior, you know, um, it's important to note that with the kind of camera that she's using in the kinds of environments that she's photographing in, the black people she's photographing are not visible to the camera, but for that light. And so it's it's an intervention that makes available something that the camera otherwise cannot reach, right? Cannot register, I should say, right? And it's one that introduces a certain kind of immediately electrified um, presence and instantaneity to every surface it touches, but it also hyper exacerbates distances and distinctions, both in terms of color relationships, but also spatially. It sort of enunciates um, the spatial recession that's so consistent in her portraiture. And in that sense, it sort of makes available a thing that is re receding from or recessed within the frame. Um, so there's a complicated kind of availability that's happening in that portrait practice. Um, you know, something I've written about in terms of her work more recently for Reflux is, is the way that in compositional terms, she's also using the movements, the independent relationship between the lens and the, the film plane of a, of a view camera to create a kind of a slightly exaggerated proscenium, right? A stage atop which her figures stand. And if you pay attention to kind of orthogonal relationships in the frame, you can quickly see that the, the way you arrive at the physical figure has been kind of elongated diagonally in such a way that it stages them, but it also pulls them back from the surface of the image. It, pull, it pulls them back into the frame. And I think this oscillation between a kind of illuminated availability and a structural recession has everything to do with um, a history of complex relationships between blackness and, and availability within the realms of the visible. And I think that um, you could well say, yes, that sheen or luster devolves around or is sort of consonant with a kind of commercial imaging practice. But if you think about it, um, the, the, the 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 equation is the equation falls flat because the objective of commercial imagery is to make you believe you can have what it's showing you and dina's portraits don't give you the luxury of assuming that that is in fact the case and they're staged in settings that but for this kind of lustrous lighting do not in fact sort of um 
shrilly declaim their, their, their perfected nature or their perfected availability. Um, I think, you know, there's, uh, there's an implication, a very, very clear implication um, for which the, the author of the essay doesn't have the courage of the convictions to out, outright state that, that Dina's work, because it's profitable and successful, constitutes an act of class traitorship. There's also uh, an implication very directly, but again, without the courage of conviction to state it, that um, she's a race traitor and that she wants to be, I think that the, the phrase is big dick energy of white male artists. I, I don't quite know on what basis someone can sort of arrogate themselves the right to psychologize people they don't know and, and make those sorts of claims. Um, but I, I think that I think that precisely this intersection between a kind of blackness that is both beautiful and and imperiled, that is both fulsome and impoverished, um, innovates in a certain kind of way. Um, people for whom a particular kind of representational politics of blackness needs to conform to uplift and to a kind of perfected, professionalized appearance. And there's, it, there's nothing realistic about, there's nothing more realistic about that than any other kind of rendering um, that, one might, that one might envisage. And for me, I think what's really so vitally important about the work is the way that it's able to straddle both the kinds of ubiquitous, um, and particular conditions of, of black social life and their material specificities, and at one and the same time um, to work in a register of, 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 of fantasy and of the fantastical. Um, and in that sense, to kind of describe how, um, as I read it, fabulation is, 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 is essential to the renewal of, 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 of black social life and black social life is inseparable from its, its susceptibility to, to penetration from the outside. I think that's a remarkable achievement in, in art photographic portraiture. I don't think we have a body of work quite like it. And I think that the fact that it unsettles people is to come you know, kind of neatly around to your book, part of the affective labor and part of the work that, that it demands. And I think that it's earned the right to demand that of us. So should we swap out again? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> swap yeah. Swap out roles. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm going to um, I'm going to ask people to bear with me because I'm not quite as fluent in these screen sharing things as Stanley is. Um, while I swap out my screen. All right. All right. There we go. Share screen. And presenter here, we can start. Okay. Hi, everyone, again. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt um, from my book, A Black Gaze. And this, I can't even tell you which one it is. <laughs> I can't remember which verse it is. Uh, so you'll have to get the book. Um, but uh, I, this gives it away. Um, so I'll just start out. The room was empty, except for the massive projector at its center. The projector's sizable scale dominated and intimidated anyone present in the vacuum of the space. Yet despite its imposing physical presence, its fullest impact was aural and sonic. While the film itself is silent, its visuality is permeated by the rhythmic monotone of a projector that suffuses the space with a rapid mechanical clicking. Its insistent drone amplifies the image it projects and simultaneously engulfs. The figure on the screen is a black woman with long braids resting on shoulders covered by a t-shirt. Just below her cropped sleeve, her arm provides the only hint of identification through the tattoo it, that clads it, Philando. The grainy black and white composition of her celluloid figuration gives heightened definition to the sheen of her face, the texture of her skin, and the taut weave of her plaits. Her movements are minimal as her initial photographic stillness transforms into subtle, gentle, and affecting motion. Chin held high, looking upward, chin bowed with eyes cast downward, glasses skimming, abundant eyelashes, absent glasses reveal soulful eyes. Ebbing side to side, adjusting in her seat, nodding occasionally, followed by an effortful in and exhale. A prayer, a meditation, or an internal monologue made manifest. 
auto portrait from 2017 by Luke Willis Thompson is a silent portrait of Diamond Reynolds, whose live Facebook broadcast seated in a car next to her partner, Philando Castillo, in the immediate aftermath of his murder by officer Geronimo Yanez in Falcon Heights, Minnesota, offered a chilling account of one of a seemingly endless series of brutal killings of innocent black men and women at the hands of law enforcement. Thompson describes it as an alternate response to her remarkable act of witnessing as a quote unquote sister image or second broadcast where her survivability is the subject of her performance. Straddling the gap between still and moving images, Auto Portrait was awarded the 2018 Deutsche Börse Prize for Photography. Thompson's sensuous piece has been celebrated and rebuked. Hailed on the one hand as an elegiac reclamation of its subject's strength, dignity, and humanity, it has, on the other hand, been the target of withering attack by detractors who view it as an aestheticization of Black suffering. As a mixed-race New Zealander of Fijian heritage, Thompson has described himself as a Black artist, albeit not of the African diaspora. It is an attribution that I take seriously as positioning him in a place of adjacency to rather than identity with the forms of anti-Black violence his pieces so poignantly evoke. It is the adjacency of indigenous and diasporic peoples linked by a vicious history of imperialism and colonization that tethers black subjects to Pacific, to, to Pacific Islanders. It is the adjacency experienced by Diamond Reynolds sitting next to her partner in a car and witnessing his murder with her three-year-old daughter trying to, com to comfort her from the back seat. It's okay, mommy. It's okay, I'm right here with her, with you. And having the composure to attempt to talk down the officer who shot him while capturing it on a cell phone and broadcasting it live to the world to bear witness to both her loss and her refusal to silence his slaughter. Adjacency, the reparative work of transforming proximity into accountability, the labor of positioning oneself in relation to another in ways that revalue and redress complex histories of dispossession. When she never eyes us direct, while she never eyes, eyes us directly, the black gaze of Diamond Reynolds captured so powerfully in auto portrait demands quiet yet arduous effective labor. It demands we partake of the labor of adjacency, which requires us to listen attentively to her quietly enthralling image and feel accountable to it. Reynolds act of defiance was her refusal to remain silent, yet auto portrait renders her neither speechless nor silent. In Thompson's carefully constructed, still moving image, Reynolds delivers a quiet but devastating critique that rests our un undivided attention. In each of the chapters or the verses that preceded this particular section in the book, I offered different insights into the power and possibility of a black gaze. And this verse extends these reflections with an important clarification. A black gaze does not describe the viewpoint of black people. It is not a gaze restricted to or defined by race or phenotype. It is a viewing practice and a structure of witnessing that reckons with the precarious state of black life in the 21st century. A black gaze transforms this precarity into creative forms of affirmation. It repurposes vulnerability and makes it regenerative. The black gaze that emerges in auto portrait does not position white spectators as the subjects of its gaze. It is a gaze that reconfigures the dominant gaze by exploiting white exclusion from and vulnerability to the opacity of blackness. In doing so, it demands forms of effective labor that implicate and impact its viewers. Black gaze, a framing that positions viewers in relation to the precarity and possibility of blackness a gaze that requires the effective labor of adjacency. Autoportrait does not grant us access to Reynolds' interior world. It challenges us instead to do the work of feeling beyond the satisfaction of identification with someone less fortunate, less secure, or utterly precarious. Thompson's black gaze demands instead that we feel the discomfort of being better off and confronted head on. We must feel beyond the security of our own situation and cultivate instead our ability to confront the precarity of less valued or actively devalued individuals and do the ongoing work of sustaining a relationship to those imperiled and precarious bodies. Thompson and Reynolds' collaborative portrait of refusal 
a refusal to be silenced or to accept the status of black disposability is amplified by a refusal to accept words or speech as either adequate or commensurate to the gravity of Reynolds' loss or the monu monumentality of the crime of devalued black life. Auto portrait forces us to engage with a black woman who overwhelms us through her reserve and control. It forces us to reckon with the everyday labor that black women have mastered since captivity, carrying loss with dignity, mourning in plain sight, and at the same time, refusing to capitulate to the mundane regularity of premature black death. Truth be told, a silent portrait of any black woman is categorically unbearable. A refusal, our refusal of words is inevitably embraced as an invitation to impose a narrative we have neither authored nor authorized. Set against the backdrop of the story Diamond Reynolds refuses not to tell, why do we demand to hear her tell it again? Why do we expect or insist that she repeat it or tell it differently? Why is this account of it without words or speech delivered instead through subtle gestures that have an effective power that exceeds words not enough? We must ask ourselves why it is so discomforting to have to listen to what we are seeing and in doing so to be accountable to the effective labor of connecting across Reynolds' quiet to engage that which exceeds words. We must consider the even more discomforting fact that Thompson's decision to strip down our encounter with Diamond Reynolds and by proxy to encounter our encounter with Philandos Castile and the murder that Reynolds allowed us to witness alongside her to a monochromatic quiet encounter with Black Death and her refusal to accept it might in fact be utterly appropriate. For the real question it and its critics pose is what script, words, speech, or text would have been commensurate. Thank you. Oops, we went somewhere it wasn't supposed to go. <laughs> Thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I have a number of things I wanted to ask you, not just sort of about this essay, but more broadly about the book. And and one place that I feel it's actually really important, perhaps, to start as we've been talking a bit about critical engagements with, you know, with our images is something that you've been doing in your writing practice, you know, fr from the very first printed book, which is narrating the specific contingent, circumstantial, embodied visual encounter you're having with these material objects. You've done that in your engagement with archival photographs. You describe their texture, their scale. You talk about the rooms that you, that you encounter them in. You describe how you enter into these different institutional spaces to get access to archives or non-institutional spaces. You talk about the, 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 the sort of the troubled historic, historical surface of the images themselves. You talk about um, your, your experience of the kind of broader moment in which you happen to be, to be experiencing them for the first time. Um, you know, in, in, in this book, In a Black Gaze, you describe the itinerary of your arrival at the places where you see the art um, and it, it strikes me that there's, that, you know, that there is both an ethics and a politics to insisting on writing about images in this way. You know, that the the majority of writing that we're given to to read about art images and even non-art images sort of, in some senses, suspends and, and does away with their materiality, and certainly doesn't describe the kind of building, the kind of people that the objects themselves are surrounded by. And so I wanted to ask if you could say a little bit about um, why and how it is that you that you write out of your specific position um, in encountering these particular kinds of physical objects, um, and you know the extent to which for you that that critical commitment has to do with an ethics and a politics around the image in in a, in a wider sense. Sure. Yeah. That's. I mean, it's a great question, and. Um, and I think it relates to uh, the conversation that we were having previously in relationship to grammar, that there is a way in which um, I think about um, artwork as doing. Um, it is doing something and it's doing something to me. Um, and that the artwork that I work, that I write about is our haptic images. Um, they are images that touch and make us feel. Um, they make us feel, they make us respond. And we have to be accountable to that responsiveness. And that would be my ethical position um, and my ethical investment in, um, 
in accounting, giving an account for the entire encounter, right? Um, because we do not encounter art, we do not encounter images in a vacuum. We encounter them in context and in contexts that are both um, the physical meeting of them, be they in a, in a gallery, be they in a photo book, be they on a screen, right? And that shapes our responses. But we also encounter them with a, a set of contexts that we bring with us. Um, they're historical, they're cultural, they're class-based, they're, they are, you know, gender-based, uh, they're generational. Um, and, you know, I was trained as a historian and, you know, context is everything. Um, and there's a way in which I'm simply bringing that particular kind of training into the world of looking, listening, watching, sensing, um, to, to build a, a kind of world um, around the encounter with art um, makes it actually, to me, it, it does something that I had never expected that people keep telling me about, which is that it makes accessible, right? It makes the act of engaging art an accessible one that is not exclusive to expertise or, or education. Um, and giving an account of oneself in relationship to art, I find is the most powerful way of talking about its uh, transformative potential. Um, so I do have an ethics and it's an ethics to be accountable to the work that art does and the work that art summons us to do. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that's tremendously important. And it, you know, it strikes me that that um, it aligns with an ethos. I remember the first place I remember reading that was in John Burge's Ways of Seeing, where he talked, he gave this kind of withering critique of Kenneth Clark and the way that his writing about images sort of suspended the reality that he even had a body or that he was seeing particular things that could have an effect on him. And I, I think so much of critical and, you know, sort of theoretical writing about art and images is, is really about mastery and demonstrating one's capacity to be um, not just superior to, but in control of the objects that one is engaged with. And it strikes me that part of what you're saying there is that, you know, the, the, the work is instead to account for how one is affected by something, which is a, a reality that so much art writing, I think, sort of just disavows or in other ways tries to, tries to repress. And in a way that connects with the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which is to, to, to kind of come back to and, and to sort of expand the definition of a black gaze that you're giving, you know, repeatedly throughout the book. And to do it, if I can, by way of, you know, your brief citation of Laura Marx's work on haptic images, uh, where she says that reversing the relation of mastery that characterizes the image is one of these defining qualities of, of, a, of a haptic experience of images. And, you then go on to talk about how there's in the practices that you're engaging in the book, um, a kind of question coming out of these black visual practices, which is what would it mean to see oneself through the complex positionality that is blackness and to work through its implications. And then later in the book, you know, in the section that you've just now read from, you, you define a black gaze as a viewing practice and a structure of witnessing that reckons with the precarious state of black life. And so I'm, I'm thinking in, in, in the sort of thread of these, these different um, definitions about, um, on the one hand, the, 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 the challenge of these, these works, these installations, these moving image works, these, these photographic prints, um, to a viewer to situate themselves in a certain kind of position, which is not about equivalence, um, and which is precisely about a susceptibility to being affected. Um, and the way that that reverses a kind of traditional notion of, of mastery as a sort of central objective of engaging with our images. And I'm, I'm thinking about the affect of labor you've described as being involved here. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about how you see these encounters being elaborated materially um, and, and the extent to which you might think that blackness and its particular history of subjugation has something to do with the changed terms that these artists are creating for their for their for their audiences and their spectators. Oh, well, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> you, you you bundled a whole bunch of questions there, and so like ah. Um, <laughs> um, where should I start? Where should I start? Um, Yes, I mean, there is, a, there is a sort of reversal of the question of mastery into being affectable uh, or 
um, which is different, you know, it was interesting the way in which you, you were using that term, which is different than, you know, Denise Ferreira de Silva's notion of affectability, right? Mm -hmm. um, and which is, you know, sort of Black people's, uh, you know, endless um, journey to not be transacted around, right? <laughs> not to be uh, instrumentalized, not to be done to. Um, and not to be assumed to be able to be done to. Um, and yes, the black gaze is trying on some level to, I mean, the first quote that you that you 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 cited was one where I was actually trying to to think about what if we move beyond, yes, equivalence, but also mm. moved to a place of implication, mm. right? So if seeing Diamond Reynolds um, is not about either putting yourself in her place or keeping yourself at a distance, what would it mean to actually feel, to be, feel implicated in what transpired mm -hmm. to her, yeah. right? Implicated in her grief, implicated in her trauma, implicated in uh, the, the impunity of the officer who killed him. Right, implicated in the fact that she has a fatherless daughter, right? Um, and that is neither about being, not it's not about identifying, it's about taking on the precarity that is not yours and doing something with it and allowing yourself to be affected by it in a way that allows you to see both yourself and um, Black subjects differently. So, so that's to me, it's a different form of adjacency, right? Um, but one that can be equally powerful. Um, and so that's what I'm, I'm grappling with. And I guess that also goes to the, the, the last point that you were asking me about, about the sort of the specificity of the history of black dispossession. Um, and, you know, as somebody who um, in a previous life, in my previous life as a historian, right, was a Black Europeanist and, and you know, lived in the Black German community. Um, the history, the specific history of our dispossession is not, well, it's not general, right? It's specific. Um, and so when the critique of Luke's positioning of himself in relationship to Blackness arises, um, by way of things like phenotype, I think about you know members of the community that I used to belong to in in Germany, where that accusation was made against people who had African parents, right? And so I feel um, that our history of dispossession is is a bridge rather than an island right? <laughs> in terms of thinking about anti-blackness um thinking about its proximity and thinking about it as um a structure of domination that is not specifically directed only at black people it has been honed on black people right <laughs> but it has also been honed in a way that has redistributed it um throughout you know imperial and colonial relations that continue on to today. Um, so yeah, so there is, there is a way in which I feel obliged to make the specific history of black dispossession into um, an opportunity uh, to understand the specificities of dispossession in a way that, that, that situates it adjacent to us. And that from that adjacency, we can actually build together. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you, you've alighted there at the end on, on one of the, you know, I think one of the, the key terms in, in your work and, you know, elsewhere you've spoken about how Luke's work really was the sort of spark for your theorization of adjacency. It, it just, it, it, it strikes me that, that um, I mean, this is, this is sort of a wider comment than, than, than the particularities of your book, but the, one of the ways people resolve the complexities of photographs is to treat them transactionally, to, to work out what do I do here so that the thing that is that is a problem is over with, right? How do I how do I close down the 
the kind of unending pressure that might otherwise be unchained by a subject a subjection to the power of a particular kind of image how do i how do i close that circuit and move on and you know i think so much of what's happening in your book is a description about a relational um kind of engagement with images in which one one allows oneself to be reconstituted by what is seen and does not at the same time presume or seek a kind of definite and comprehensive closure and ending to that relation the, the, the point isn't um to sever things off but rather to to accept a kind of ongoingness in a certain kind of interentanglement between me as a perceiving spectator and a given image, a given community that is represented by it and so forth. And I think that shift is really important. I, I, I think that um, a relational way of dealing with and engaging um, with images is, is one that, that, that accepts a kind of constant capacity of being made all over again, sort of subject to the force that they might bring to bear upon us. And where those images figure certain kinds of violence, certain kinds of inequity, and those kinds of inequities and violence are intractable, I think the desire is to end the exposure to it transactionally, right? To kind of mm. close the loop and be able to walk away. Mm. And one of the things that seems to have shifted over the course of the last, let's say, seven years is, is um, the, the level of protagonism in Black visual practice on visual culture in a very wide sense. Um, and the kind of thinkability and, and um, sensibility um, of Black experience as itself a kind of legitimate equal actor um, in certain kinds of scenes, um, in, certain, in certain kinds of contexts. And it's, it strikes me that, that part of the kind of critical battle in, in writing about the imagery that emerges from these histories and these communities is, is trying to demonstrate both the the possibility of, of, of a relational engagement that is open and therefore that is kind of open to its own vulnerability and also the perils and the kind of inherent violence of a transactional engagement that really is about give me a thing so I can then move on and, and you can go your separate way. Um, I, I just sort of wanted to observe that it wasn't I, I didn't say that in the form of a question but because I do think that part of the the, the melange, if you like, the kind of the merging of all of these experiences and, and, and disparate communities together in your book is, is about um, a kind of expanding openness where we're dealing in one instant um, with Debbie Sims Africa, and then another instant we're thinking about Philando Castile and Diamond Reynolds, and those are two disparate communities. You know, I, I, I think that that kind of continual opening is, is is um, a kind of ethic that we need to attend to and that the lens of getting through it, the kind of lens of black survival and, and black expression um, is, a, is a really effective way of, of accomplishing that. So I mean, I, I can't agree more with you. And, and I feel like that is, that's the project. It's the project is, you know, to be able to learn the different modalities of black survival. Um, and at the same time, to think beyond um to 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 not let that keep us in the now to be able to use that to to think beyond it right and and yeah and the complete i mean in in doing this work and or in writing this book and in thinking about the work of the artists that i'm writing about that was what i marveled at is that each one of them were able to give us a, a, a like a vast catalog of black survival, right? And black creativity in survival. And, you know, and black grace in survival. Um, so yeah, and, and I and I feel like all I am doing is amplifying that through the work of um of others. Um yeah. Yeah, I think very eloquently. I wonder. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think very eloquently. So I was wondering. Yeah, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I was gonna, I know that we should open for, for questions here and I have a couple sort of in my back pocket, especially about <laughs> the writing on Simone Lee here, but but I, I want to yeah, okay. invite members of the audience um, or other members of, of, of the, the call to, to chime in with a, a response or a question if they have one. Yeah, yeah, this is the point where we, we dare somebody to actually pose a question <laughs> and, and wait for it to pop up in the, in the chat, which is always fun. Um, I didn't see anything in the chat. And I 
think actually it was a talk with Stanley earlier this year where you sat in silence just waiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hugely uncomfortable. But. Yeah, no, we did a good like 20 or 30 second tumbleweed moment on a call in July and I felt it was important to mark the quiet, you know, by not mm. interrupting it. Yeah, we can try that here. Okay. I already feel myself getting it. Um, but we do welcome some questions. So um, yeah, there are a few of you in the room and I know a lot of you have really interesting questions or probably sitting on some comments you want to make. So now would be the time. It's tempting to call on someone. <laughs> Imagine. Very pedagogical of you, Lisa. <laughs> um, well, I might start us off though, and um, Stanley, you kind of segged a little bit uh, onto it, but I was thinking about your comments on Black Grace coming through notions of survival, really both of you, but um, I wonder, Tina, if you could comment a little bit more on uh, some of your discussion around Khalil Joseph and the relationship to Roy de Carava and thinking about um, the everyday of like the Black experience, you know, family life, how that plays out on New York streets, um, mm. how it's cinematically transformed through Khalil Joseph's work, whether it's in um, video or there, I suppose, more of his fine art or artistic practice. Is there something yeah, that you can sure. do there? Happily. I mean, I mean, Khalil takes on this feat that, that basically nobody in the world would take on is what would it mean to um, animate Sweet Fly Paper of Life? I mean, like, that exquisite, exquisite text, you know, as a photographic text, what would it mean to make it move? And what would it mean to make it move, make those images move in a contemporary moment? Um, I mean, that's, a, it's almost sacrilege, but he does it. <laughs> he does it and he does it um, through, um, through the animation of his own family. Um, and, you know, Sweet Fly Paper of Life, Roy de Carava's masterpiece was about family life in Harlem. Um, it was about these intimate relationships um, and, and walking through those intimate relationships um, and being part of them. And so what he does in that film is pastiche. It's not a montage, but he does a really glorious kind of um, pastiche of these kind of everyday quotidian um, scenes in Harlem life. Um, at, le at the eye level, which is what I appreciate most. So you're, you're at eye level with the people you're passing, you're at eye level with the people you're behind, you're at eye level at the people in a party, um, on the stairs, right? You're in all of these different kinds of um, intimate spaces by virtue of the, the closedness of them. It's not this kind of expansive view. It really is about how tight New York City is, right? How you are constantly up against one another, um, which was also one of the themes of, of Flypaper, Sweet Flypaper of Life. And then he does this other thing where he, you know, braids in uh, images of his own family, images of, um, uh, of different generations of family. And then it ends in this, this extraordinary scene where you have a kind of intergenerational duet between um, Ben Vereen and I was in a conversation with some, between Ben Vereen and Storyboard P, but I was in a conversation with um, Mark Anthony Neal where he made this point that was amazing that I hadn't thought about, which is he said, you know, for, for many people, Ben Vereen will always be Chicken George. <laughs> you know? will always be chicken George as how an entire generation got to know him when in fact I got to know him as a Fosse dancer through Pippin um, and that he is now a, you know a very senior man but who still can move like a dancer and he's dancing with this you know somebody who could be his grandchild right storyboard P who's doing a very very different kind of dance flex dance and they're, they can do an, a seamless duet and, you know, and visually the way in which it actually happens to me is that there's a way in which uh, Storyboard P is orbiting him 
and giving him the kind of aura, the kind of photographic aura through his motion that you see in many of, um, of de Carava's works. So, um, so I, that's a, that's sort of a brief riff um, on on your question, which I I love. I you know I love talking about Khalil's work, and of course I love talking about Sweet Pie Paper of Life, which is one of my favorite books in the world, photo books in the world. <laughs> um, just just at the end there, we had a sorry, Louisa. I, I just wondered because you were nodding your head while Tina was speaking, and I wondered if you had any. Um, I mean, I know it was a specific question to something that Tina cites, but I wondered if you had like a take also on the, I don't know, the relationship between Khalil and how he takes some of the still imagery and the blackness from Roy's work and animates it, or if you wanted to bring it into a totally different direction. I mean, I think I'm, I'm, I'm eager to, to actually circle back to a question that's just come in at the sort of at the tail end of, of Tina's response, because it, it, it opens up, I think, a, an opportunity to, to talk about some other, other elements of the book, but also, I think, maybe to, to, to confront a problematic that, that recurs. I, Marie Smith has asked about um, Luke Willis Thomas and, sorry, I think she means Thompson, but Luke Willis Thompson and um, his decision or his sort of continuing practice of making work that's about suffering and asking, you know, it seems like she's asking whether he should stop doing that or um, whether it excludes in some way, I suppose, and I'm paraphrasing here, so apologies mm -hmm. if this isn't, is inaccurate, but it, whether it excludes the potential for exploring blackness in relationship to realms of joy. Um, and yeah, I, I think, I, I think, She's asking a question um, that's about, you know, something you've written about and about a person that you're, you're in relationship with. So I, I'm curious to hear how you might respond to that, but I also have some thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly isn't a question that I can answer on his behalf. Um, but I, you know, I guess the question in this moment in time is, um, What does it mean to highlight that pain, that suffering, in a way that does not make it pornographic? And I would say that it is not, it's not pornographic. It doesn't make it into the object of pity or the object of, um, of empathy, which is, which is, a challenge, right? Um, I'm not anti-empathy, but empathy has frequently been used as a way of not, of not, of, of, of masking, right? One's own um, implication. Um, and so I don't have a problem. <laughs> I don't have a problem with uh, work on black suffering that makes people work, that makes people uncomfortable. I have a problem with work on black suffering um, that doesn't do that, um, that doesn't make any demands on me as a viewer. Um, and so, um, and also, I mean, we need to think about the moment and time in which we're living. Um, and also about the expertise of, of different artists. You know, there are certain artists who work in certain media and in certain and in certain thematics. And I leave that to them. I really, really do. And, and I'm not going to make a demand of a particular artist to do a particular kind of work because they may not do it very well. <laughs> you know, to be perfectly honest, they may not do it very well. Um, but I appreciate what you're saying, uh, what the, what, um, what, is your name Marie Smith is asking, um, and at the same time, you know, I appreciate somebody like uh, Jen Inkiru, who mm -hmm. is able to express, you know, black joy at, a, at an extraordinarily exquisite level. Um, I appreciate somebody like um, Arthur Jaffa, who is pushing us. I mean, he explicitly says he's not, he, he's not, um, his work is not about black joy, but it's about black pleasure and that the difference between black pleasure and black joy is important. Um, and so, I, again, I don't want to presume what, what an artist's best medium is. I want them to do their best work there, 
you know, where they feel that they can express something. And I mean, I also feel like there is a, that he is trying to express something very quite genuine. So yeah, yeah, that's my answer to that. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would add I, uh, to that, not sort of an elaboration of your argument, but in terms of how I think about this question of the kind of protagonism or the kinds of sort of context it, of appearance in which um, black art or art about blackness has emerged that I, I, I think um, it's easy to, to sort of overlook how paradigmatic the, the shift in those images that constitute our kind of shared sociality has been over the last decade. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it's it's not it it has not been the norm in American or in British life um, that the imagery of anti-black violence would constitute the main element on the visual menu of culture. You know, on, on a monthly or you know seasonal basis, year after year after year, that has not been the case. Um, and I think it reconfigures social relationships for that for for that to suddenly be the case. You know, and. I think that it, it makes sense to me that people are triangulating their relationship to the kind of historical present that we're occupying, partly through the lens of that shift and partly through the, the sort of present and histories of experience that it, that it figures. Um, I think that people are grappling with um, the constitutive role of anti-Black violence in the preservation of, 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 of everyday life. And so it, it does make sense to me that, that suffering sort of constitutes a pole, you know, um, in this shifting landscape to which we're, you know, sort of drawn back again and again. And it's a complicated thing to reckon with because to disavow its ongoingness would be unethical and, and, and plainly inaccurate. Um, certainly there's always a risk in some scenarios that one can determine, over-determine its significance. And I think, you know, your book is about Black expressive um, capacity and its transformative effect on a changed spectatorship. So that in itself is about like what is being done in, in acknowledgement and recognition of what is happening, right? So that I think moves very clearly beyond the, the, the kind of trap I'm describing there. But I also think, you know, a, a number of the essays in my book um, are about artists who are white and artists who are photographing both white people exclusively and on the other hand, photographing quite diverse demographics of people. And one of the things that, that irked me about a lot of the kind of developments over the course of the last decade was the extent to which these kinds of artistic engagements were left at the margin of, of sort of institutional recognition um, in any number of different ways. It struck me that a number of these artists were thinking about their individual implication in the historical moment they were living in and in the very segregated communities that they occupy, particularly here in America. Um, and the, that too kind of constituted in some oblique or in some ways, in some senses, direct way, a response to this paradigmatic shift I've just now been describing. And that it seemed to me that outside of the book, other kind of art photographic spaces really weren't accommodating of these kinds of works. And I suspect maybe naively that part of that is about the kind of mirror that it would hold up to the institutions themselves. Um, you know, it's funny that, you know, you've written about Luke's work, who won the Deutsche Borsa Prize, and I've written about Dana's work, who also won the Deutsche Borsa Prize, um, and created an extraordinary 22-year record of, of Black and Brown familial life in, in imperial courts in Los Angeles that began in, the, in the, the wake of the Rodney King Rebellion, and that work has not once been exhibited anywhere in the United States of America, you know, and I, I don't think that that's an insignificant fact. Um, so, and, and Dana's work to also sort of link back to Marie's question is not about black suffering. It's about black communal life. Mm. Um, it's about the, the difficulty of sustaining it in a sense. The thing that runs in the background of it is, is that the, the ongoing recurrence of natal alienation, right? That the afterlife of slavery. Um, and I, I think, it, I think it's meaningful, um, that there are these kinds of gaps in the record and it's 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 to our benefit that there are publishers like Roma who published you know Dana's book because but for the object would these 343 photographs have been seen you know to me the fact that they, that it's conceivable they could have both won that prize and never have been seen in this country tells us something about um the kind of critical and ethical climate in which these artists are having to work and survive do you know I mean one thing that that just I was thinking about in listening to your response um, 
Stanley. And and thank you, thank you again, Marie, <laughs> because it's it's a really wonderful question. Um, is what if we there's a different way that we can actually think about um, uh, Luke's work um, in Auto Portrait and in Cemetery, um, which is a, a sister piece that's on uh, you know Black British um, losses to police brutality, um, which is that they're both works that visualize Black mourning, right? <laughs> And, and grief and grievance. And that in so many ways, that's what, what black communities don't get to do, right? Through the spectacularization of black death is we don't get to grieve, we don't get to mourn. And that is never on anywhere. That is never visualized anywhere. That's something that we have to do alone in you know in silence in isolation within our communities and that that is something that is one of the things i find most powerful about both those those works is the way in which he is confronting us with the loss he's not confronting us with the murder he's confronting us with those who survived and have to live with that grief right live in that state of mourning and live through that tremendous loss and that's one of the things that is so devastating about it. Um, you're not re-watching, you know, the Rodney King beating, right? You're watching the pain of somebody who had someone taken from them. And so I feel like we also need to broaden our lens of what constitutes um, uh, Black death to include Black grief, mourning, and living beyond that. Um, which is the thing that I find is never, you know, that's never spectacularized. Right? It's never spectacularized our capacity to withstand serial losses um, and to still continue. Um, yeah, so I, I guess that's what I wanted to say. Um, um, yeah, so. Yeah. It's a good point to, to, to leave off. I know that we've run slightly yeah. long on time here, um, but I've really but enjoyed talking with you about this, Tina. Yeah. Yes, me too. It's it's when funny how those little here. things <laughs> will continue. Get back over here to be continued. Yeah. I very and much thank hope you, so. Lisa, for that. Yeah, thank you both so much. That is a very powerful uh note to end on thinking about the ritual of death and um how hidden it is on a wider scale generally because of how uncomfortable it is. But I don't know how to wrap up that up elegantly. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I'll we'll just say some thank yous. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight, uh, especially to our speakers, uh, Tina Kant and Stanley Moloko Wanambwa, uh, to Jess Goff and the rest of the team there, to my colleagues Janice McLaren and Martin Sinninger for their support tonight, and to you all for your ongoing commitment to the gallery. Uh, we wouldn't be here without you, and we continue to be grateful to be welcomed into your homes and to have the opportunity to share um, the important work of these two uh, speakers tonight. If you have a moment, um, yeah, do keep checking our website for more information on forthcoming events. And hopefully we'll see you at the gallery when we open again this coming Friday, if you are in London or coming to London anytime soon. Um, we are opening with a retrospective of American photographer, Helen Levitt and new commission by British artist, Helen Kamick. And we do have some activities and events coming related to both those exhibitions if you're unable to come um, visit in person. So uh, thank you all again and have a good evening. Um, thanks, Stanley. Thanks, Tina. Thanks so much. I had some um, email and everything with details. Thanks but. so much. Take care. Bye bye. I'll tell you around and see you this week, Tina and Stanley. <laughs> anyway, bye. Bye bye.